Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to day two of Megger's Virtual Substation Best Practices Seminar. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentations and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenters. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of each presentation. Today, we will have two separate presentations with their own Q&A sessions, so please stick around after our first presentation concludes. The presenter for our first segment today is Charles Nybeck, Applications Engineer. His segment will highlight the application of factory acceptance testing. Afterwards, we will go ahead with a second presentation, which emphasizes the application of power transformer PD testing in the field. To assist with the question and answer session, we will have Jerome Goudertier, Senior Service Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Charles. Thank you, Michael. And thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Charles Nybeck. I'm an applications engineer at Megger. And today we will be discussing factory acceptance testing, induced voltage partial discharge for power and distribution transformers. <clears throat> Let's start with our presentation outline where first we'll start by discussing partial discharge fundamentals. Then we'll move into some normative references. Then we'll cover factory acceptance testing then move into covering the ICM system, and then combine the two to talking about factory acceptance testing with the ICM system, and then end it with a summary. On to partial discharge fundamentals. So what exactly is partial discharge? Uh, according to the IEC 6270, a partial discharge is a localized electrical discharge that only partially bridges the insulation between conductors and which can or cannot occur adjacent to a conductor. And that goes on to state that partial discharges in general are, are a consequence of local electrical stress concentrations in the insulation or on the surface of the insulation. So basically partial discharge is present when the voltage stress across a void or the surface of an insulation exceeds the dielectric strength of that insulating material. And when this happens, there are several physical and chemical changes that happen that can produce emissions that we can detect. And this can be in the form of dielectric losses, electromagnetic transients, pressure waves, sound, light, heat, and in terms of chemical changes, can, uh, partial discharge can even produce ozone, which is particularly corrosive and a, and a trouble for encapsulated environments. Now, partial discharge can manifest itself in multiple ways where we have, have an example of three here. The first is a void discharge where you have a void or a bubble within your solid or within your insulation. And this is typically going to be filled with air and have a much lower dielectric strength than the surrounding uh, insulating material. So if you apply a high voltage, the electrical uh, or the electrical stress is going to be highest at this point because the, the, the dielectric strength is going to be the lowest within the void. And that's, that could be a potential place for partial discharge to take place. Another type of partial discharge is surface discharges, where maybe you have contamination or moisture on the surface of your, uh, your insulating material, and this causes a local electric field and can uh, bypass your dielectric strength, and therefore you have your discharges against your surface of your electrode or your, uh, your insulating material and could cause surface tracking. Finally, you have corona discharge in which you have your high voltage potential that's not necessarily touching your ground or your insulation, but is separated by a gaseous medium here. And the dielectric, once the dielectric strength is, is exceeded um, by the electric field, you can have partial discharges actually through that gaseous medium to uh, your ground potential. So exactly what, what causes the occurrence of partial discharge? For partial discharge to take place, it's necessary for two conditions to be met. The first is the local electric field must have reached or surpassed the critical inception field. And the second condition is that a free electron must be available to start the, the discharge avalanche. And you can kind of see a visual of the Townsend avalanche or discharge, and we'll talk about that in detail in the next slide. And there are two main processes to derive this initial electron. One is ionization by photons, in which a photon hits a gas molecule and frees an electron. And the other is by field emissions, 
uh, by induced or that are induced by electrostatic fields. And it's due to these statistical properties that that and uh, that possess control over the appearance of the partial discharge pattern. And we'll take an example of of two different processes uh, a little later. Now, looking into the ionization process, the initial discharge mechanism contains only collision ionization in which no space charges are involved. And this is the so-called Townsend discharge that we saw. And the Townsend discharge mechanical me mechanism concerns the so-called tri-shell discharges as it occurs at a sharp point at the negative half cycle of the applied voltage. And this figure shows the avalanche discharge or tri-shell discharge glow and corona. And again, where the ionization here uh, is a process that occurs due to collisions. Now this figure shows the generation of an additional charge, uh, discharge avalanche due to photo ionization. And then the discharge changes to what's called the streamer discharge due to the ionization process. And this consists of both collision and photo ionization. Now the next escalation of the gas discharge process is thermal ionization. And in case temperatures in the discharge channel increase enough to, all, to cause thermal ionization, the number of free electrons increases rapidly and the current through the narrow channel increases strongly as well. And this results in the so-called leader discharges seen here. And this is the strongest partial discharge mode before breakdown. And in air, a leader discharge can only be maintained in the case of a strongly inhomogeneous electric field and comparable large distances. As said before, it is necessary for free electrons uh, for partial discharge to take place. So in terms of metallic surfaces where there's plenty of free electrons, you'd have immediate inception of partial discharge or partial discharge would immediately take place once your electric field surpasses or reaches your critical field. But in the event or of polyameric low energy surfaces that offer literally no electrons, no free electrons, ionization would be needed. And if we look at the ambient source of radioactivity, this causes about two times ten of the uh, two times ten to the six free electrons um, per second and a cubic meter, and this re results in delayed inception. So, for instance, statistically speaking, it takes an average of 15 minutes until a spherical void of one millimeter in diameter is hit and the discharge takes place. And this is a problem because the common testing time for epoxy mold equipment is often too short. For instance. In the, the example of cast resin transformers, the test time is only three minutes, which is one fifth of the statistical average time for a spherical void of one millimeter uh, to be hit and uh, discharge start to take place. So it's recommended that uh, longer test periods be utilized. Here we have an example of typical breakdown strengths of insulating materials, where at the top we have air. And air is 78% nitrogen and is an electropositive gas, and this makes air a, a poor insulator. But other gases such as hydrogen and SF6 can become good insulators when used in the compressed form, such as GIS and GIL. And the reason being is if we look at Poisson's law, we can relate the, the breakdown strength to uh, pressure times distance. So here is a graph of a couple of Poisson curves for uh, different materials, and we can see as the pressure increases, so does the breakdown strength. And in this, for instance, in the case of SF6, the breakdown strength at four bar is three times higher than at one bar. Also, these different um, materials cause different properties in the partial discharge signal itself. For instance, looking at nitrogen, again, electropositive gas, the rise time is much slower than that is of SF6 and results in a more narrow band measuring bandwidth. And we'll look at the, the effect of this a little later in the presentation. Here we have a visualization of the historic evolution of, of early meters, where at the bottom here, we actually have a radio influence voltmeter um, that was used before partial discharge uh, measurements really kind of started taking off. Then it's, we move to the oscilloscope and Lissajou function where the Lissajou uh, was uh, particularly good at showing symmetry in your measurement. Next, we had the count distribution where we can see the x-axis is the magnitude of the discharge in, in nanocoulombs. And we have in the y-axis, the repetition rate or the count of the counts of discharge. 
here we have the more common VQN or phase resolved partial discharge pattern. And this is actually a three dimensional graph on a two dimensional plot. And what I mean by that is the X axis contains the phase angle in degrees and the Y axis contains the magnitude of the discharge in nanocoulombs in this case. But the third dimension is actually the color of the plot where the color represents the repetition or the counts of discharge. Looking down here at the yellow, we can see the highest repetition rate and it starts to decay as we move up into the red, pink, and gray areas. And another way to look at this, and I may kind of put this together, is a three-dimensional plot, where this, these two, believe it or not, are actually the same plot. This is just a three-dimensional plot where they utilize the extra axis for the counts, and then they have charge and phase angle as well. Next, we'll look at an example of discharges in a spherical gas inclusion, in this case, with the high availability of a starting electron. <laughs> Looking at the graph, we can see that the, the electric field starts at the residual field and increases as the applied voltage goes up and reaches the critical field. And since we have the high availability of starting electrons, once the critical field is met, the discharge takes place. As the voltage is still rising, the electric field is still rising, and the critical field is met, and discharge takes place again. And you can see that this goes on until our change in polarity, as the charge, uh, the electric field charges again, we reach the critical field, inception field, partial discharge takes place, and so on. So what this results in is a nice, small magnitude, evenly distributed partial discharge taking place every time the critical field is met. And if we actually look at the phase resolved partial discharge pattern for this, we can see the low magnitude partial discharges in this nice evenly distributed pattern and uh, primarily on the first and third quarter of the applied voltage. Oppositely, if we take a look at the spherical gas inclusion, but this time with a low availability of starting electrons, we can see that we are already at the critical field, but no breakdown is, is occurring. Our electric field uh, increases as the applied voltage does, and, and we can see that we have a random occurrence of breakdown um, at this point, and you can see the magnitude of this breakdown is significantly higher than what we had before. And this is due to the fact that we, since we, have, we don't have the, the advantage of having a high availability of starting electrons, the discharges are gonna become more random. And we can again see the electrical field increase and then a random discharge take place twice here. And this results in a phase resolved partial discharge pattern where we can obviously see the growing magnitude and then the discharge take place. And these don't necessarily follow the first and third quarter as the previous one with the high availability of electrons is. But again, we can see the electric field increasing and then partial discharge taking place at that higher magnitude. So part, we know that partial discharge is caused by dielectric stress. And this can be in many forms, such as non-homogeneous distribution of the electric field. You could have the presence of bubbles in your solid or liquid insulation, punctual effects that localize the dielectric stress on an insulation, presence of your moisture, cracks, water, or other contaminations on your insulation surface, and of course, voltage exceeding the dielectric strength of the insulating material. It's worthy to note that partial discharge current pulses occur within the high voltage apparatus and therefore cannot be measured directly since the partial discharge source is not uh, accessible. But instead, we come up with several other ways of measuring that are, class are broken down into two classifications. On the top here, we have the conventional method that's covered in the IEC 6270 standard. And we're gonna go into this in depth. And then this is where you measured the so-called apparent charge. Next, the next class is the unconventional methods in which can include electromagnetic, acoustic, optical, or chemical detection. And we have bolded the electromagnetic and acoustic detection as those will be two that are covered in this presentation. Here we have a comparison of offline versus online measurements where offline measurement, offline testing is accord in accordance to the IEC 6270 standard and is most relevant for laboratory and workshop setups. As the, the, as the testing states, this is performed offline, so the device under test must be taken out of service, and the high voltage terminals and, or, or bus bars must be isolated. 
and the uh, the re and requires the separate set power supply to induce the partial discharge activity. And this could come in the form of uh, resonant test systems, damped alternating voltage sources, VLF sources, high pot, as well as step up transformers. Uh, since this perform this measurement is performed offline, it's going to be on a cold conductor circuit, meaning it will be under the no load condition. Also, the gas type, pressure, and humidity are, may differ from the operating condition. But some advantages are noise sources other than possibly radiated noise can be eliminated. And in during offline testing, you have the ability to vary your excitation mode, for example, performing applied voltage tests or single phase induced or three phase induced. On the opposite side, we have online testing. And this is typical for commissioning and on site testing. Um, this is this can be demanding to manage with corona noise from transformers above 110 kV, but it, it allows the ability to detect load-induced partial discharge problems and allows for more frequent testing or the ability for monitoring partial discharge activity, which offers a major strength in the tre overall trending ability. Also, it permits examination of the device throughout the condi all conditions of the factor of influence, including power loading temperature, and humidity. Now that we've taken a look over the fundamentals, let's move into some normative references. <clears throat> Power and distribution transformers are a vital part of every distribution network and are complex structures of mixed materials and components that ultimately result in an RLC or resistive, inductive, and capacitive network within themselves. There are extensive factory acceptance test requirements and numerous standards in, uh, that address factor acceptance testing for power and distribution transformers. And there's, they distinguish between the ratings as well as dry type and oil immersed transformers. Here we have a list of a few of the most relevant standards which address transformer factor acceptance testing in one way or another. First, we look at the standards defined by the IEC. There are two IEC standards that should be highlighted out of the list. First of all is the IEC 660, and that defines the basic requirements for high voltage measurements on all types of equipment, which makes it a horizontal standard. The second standard to mention is the IEC 676-3, which per definition refers to power transformers, which are usually oil immersed due to the power ratings. It can be considered a quasi-horizontal standard when it comes to partial discharge testing of transformers. And this is due to the fact that this was one of the first standards for transformers mentioning partial discharge testing. And therefore, other standards, even ones focused on dry type transformers, such as the IEC 676-11, often reference back to the IEC 676-3. The second half consists of the IEEE standards, where the IEEE grouped the relevant standards for transformers under the C57 umbrella. And this includes the C57.12.01, for factor acceptance testing on dry type transformers, and then the C57.12.00 for testing of oil immersed transformers. Now, the older versions of the mentioned standards refer mostly to the radio influence voltage testing, which we had saw a actual old uh, detector um, previously. Now, you, I may ask, why RIV testing? And that's due to the fact that in the 1930s, it was a critical problem that some of the parts of the high voltage equipment seemed to interfere with radio signals. And it was found that these interferences had been identified to be created by corona. And RIV testing or radio influence voltage testing uh, has been introduced as a solution to detect possible corona problems before putting the device under test into operation. And due to this approach, radio influence voltage testing focuses on problems of high voltage equipment in operation and is not intended to be a diagnostic tool. But with ongoing research, partial discharge measurements were found to give detailed information about the complete insulation system of transformers as a diagnostic tool. And this provides more than simple pass or fail criteria and partial discharge measurements also detect corona, which is the main reason for a radio interference voltage measurement. Therefore, as time goes on, partial discharge measurements have started to supersede uh, the RIV or radio influence voltage measurements. Coming to the standards referring partial discharge measurements, the first and foremost or, or most important that should be mentioned and has been mentioned previously is the IEC 6270. 
and it defines the common partial discharge testing method using a coupling capacitor together with the measuring impedance as a measurement circuit. And this kind of IEC 6270 compliant partial discharge testing is referred to as the conventional method. So just to highlight, the conventional method that we had talked about earlier utilizes a coupling capacitor with a measurement impedance as its measurement circuit. And since all kinds of factory acceptance tests are done using this conventional method, fulfilling the IEC 6270 is a basic requirement for partial discharge testing during the factory acceptance test. On the other hand, you have the IEC 62478, which focuses on non-conventional partial discharge testing. So either acoustic or electrical or electromagnetic measurements that we had talked about that can be taken using special antenna type sensors or by varying frequency ranges, mainly the UHF or ultra high frequency range. Also, you have the IEEE C57113 that is based on the preceding standards for radio influence voltage testing, namely the NEMA 107, but also referencing the IEC 6270 and IEC 676-3, as well as the IEEE 454-1973. While the IEC and its amendment in 2015 contains a detailed list of requirements covering not only the detector, calibrator, and other factors in which manufacturers of equipment for measuring partial discharges must take into place, we're gonna focus on the restraints that have, been, that have to be considered when performing a factor acceptance test on a transformer. And these are the allowed frequency measurements. First, you have your wideband measurements where the wideband measurement should be, uh, the bandwidth should be between 100 kilohertz and 900 kilohertz and you have a limit on your upper and lower frequencies as well, where your lower limit is between 30 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz, while your upper corner frequency is uh, less than one or should not exceed one megahertz. Now, the second option are your narrow band measurements, and here your bandwidth is between nine kilohertz and 30 kilohertz, where your center frequency is between or is above 50 kilohertz, but not to exceed one, one megahertz. Now, one note is narrow band measurements have some serious disadvantages. For instance, they suffer from strong oscillations that are created by the utilized bandpass filter. And these oscillations make it nearly impossible to distinguish the polarity of the partial discharge pulse correctly. Furthermore, the long decay time due to these oscillations limits the possible time resolution for your repetitive partial discharge pulses. Therefore, it's recommended to perform the test utilizing the wideband measurement. Now, so let's start by taking a look in accordance to the IEC 676 baseline standards for factory acceptance testing. Partial discharge is part of the induced voltage test, either combined with a withstand test or as a standalone induced voltage partial discharge test. And according to the IEC 676-3, partial discharge testing is mandatory for power transformers with maximum voltages above 72.5 kV. And for power transformers below 72.5 kV, the need to do partial discharge testing depends on an agreement between the supplier and the customer. Now, partial discharge is mandatory for all dry type transformers falling under the testing standard of the IEC 676-11. And these are transformers with a maximum voltage of 30, below 36 kV and a power rating above 1 kVA for single transformers or 5 kVA for three-phase transformers. Now that we've discussed factory acceptance testing under the IEC standards, let's take a look at what the IEEE has to say. One difference in the IEEE is, or is that the IEEE refers to the nominal voltage rather than the maximum voltage. But within the IEEE procedure, partial discharge testing is mandatory for class two power transformers with nominal voltages between 115 kV and 765 kV, translating to a maximum voltage range of 121 to 800 kV. Partial discharge testing is not required for oil-filled class one power transformers or distribution transformers, where class one power transformers are defined as any transformer with a nominal voltage less than or equal to 69 kV, and a distribution transformer is usually referred to as any normal transformer with a rating between five and 500 kVA. For diode type transformers, partial discharge testing is mandatory for any transformer above 1.2 kV with cast resin or solid cast uh, encapsulated windings. Here in this slide, 
we show the voltage curve that it has to be applied during the partial discharge test for an oil immersed transformer. First, the voltage has to be raised to 1.5 times the maximum voltage for five minutes during this period, and then is raised to the enhanced voltage level of 1.7 times the maximum voltage, and then drop down back to the 1.5 times maximum voltage and held here for one hour while values are recorded every five minutes. It's important to note that the voltage apl is applied at a higher frequency to avoid core saturation at these elevated voltages, and also the higher frequency shortens the time to enhance the voltage or the time that the enhanced voltage has to be kept. Speaking of the time of the enhanced voltage has to be kept, there are three conditions. Let's take a look. For enhanced voltages uh, durations, and according to the IEC 676-3, for transformers with a max voltage less than 800 kV, the time applied must be 120 times the rated frequency over the test frequency, but no less than 15 seconds. Now, if the maximum rating is over 800 kV, then the, the applied time would be 600 times the relation of rated and test frequency, but no less than 75 seconds. Then we have the IEEE C57.113, where the applied time for the enhanced voltage would be 7,200 cycles. Now there's another deviation of the IEEE, that is the length of the first step here, where the IEC recommends five minutes. The IEEE refers to a period long enough to ensure the inception voltage uh, for partial discharge within transformers. And it's recommended a minimum of 10 minutes, but experiments have shown that 10 minutes may be insufficient and that 15 minutes or more uh, may be considered. The IEC 676-3 requires partial discharge measurements on all bushings above 72.5 kV, up to six bushings. And these are usually done at the test tap. And we'll take a look at that uh, when we look at the measurement diagram. The induced voltage partial discharge test is passed when the voltage did not collapse over the com uh, complete sequence and the following criteria are met for one hour. First is the acceptance limit, depending on the standard or agreement range of 250 picocoulomb. Next is the noise floor should be below 50 picocoulomb. The third one is during the one hour measurement, partial discharge shall not increase by more than 50 picocoulombs and no rising trend nor uh, sudden increase in the last 20 minutes shall occur. Otherwise the measurement should be extended or has to be extended by one hour. Another common acceptance criteria is 500 picocoulomb for uh, limit for the enhanced voltage level and 300 picocoulomb for the one hour duration. Beyond that, beyond the required six bushings to comply with the standard, measuring from additional decoupling points, for instance, the neutral, the neutral or the tertiary windings can provide valuable information in case of failures. Now we look at the dry type transformers and when compared to the requirements for doing partial discharge measurements over power, uh, power transformers, Partial discharge testing for distribution transformers is less complicated. For instance, only the, only, uh, only the high voltage windings are measured because you don't have the availability of the bushings and test taps as you do on power transformers. So partial discharge testing on distribution transformers must be done utilizing coupling capacitors. Also, the test sequence is much shorter. However, the acceptance limit, which is 10 picocoulombs, is over a factor of 20 stricter than when compared to oil immersed transformers. But again, looking at the testing times that we, it's only 180 seconds, so three minutes. And as we mentioned before, the recommended minimum time to ensure inception for partial discharge is 10 minutes, and even 15 minutes is recommended. So this three minute testing time may not be sufficient to reliably detect partial discharge. Now let's take a, a short overview of what partial discharges in transformers look like and what signals they radiate. Partial discharge, as we know, is a breakdown in the small area of the overall insulation as seen here. And the discharge uh, takes place um, when a local electric field within the imperfection of the insulation due to an electron avalanche. And each avalanche generates three measurable signals. One is the local displacement current pulse, another is electromagnetic pulses, and the other is acoustic signals. Let's take a deeper look at these. At the origin, the local displacement current pulse has a rise time in the range of one uh, nanosecond for nitrogen or close to air conditions, which translates to the bandwidth of 350 megahertz maximum. But due to the RLC network of the transformer, this current pulse then is translated to a voltage pulse 
on its way to the measurement terminals and experiences attenuation, dispersion, reflection, and filtering. And these effects are actually magnified due to the fact that the pulse is a high frequency signal. Despite these effects though, the signal still stays up to some correlation with the real discharge value at the origin. However, for failures within the winding, a deviation between the real and measured charge has been known to be up to 15, 50%. And this is why the measured value at the taps is referred to as the apparent charge. The previously mentioned electron avalanche also causes electromagnetic pulses, which are radiated in all directions as seen in this here, where we have in our Z and X and Y directions. While the discharges in nitrogen go up to 350 megahertz, the discharges in oil or solid materials can show frequency components above 350 megahertz. And these are referred to as your ultra high frequency or UHF signals and, and can be decoupled by using UHF antennas. However, the UHF signal cannot be correlated with the amount of discharge at the origin, meaning you cannot calibrate it in terms of picocoulomb. Instead, the measurement is shown here as de uh, decibel per microvolt. And this is due to the fact that the signal strength strongly depends on the location of the antenna and the travel path of the electromagnetic pulse through the transformer tank. And finally, we have the, uh, the electron avalanche also radiates an acoustic signal due to the pressure increase and the heating with impact of the surrounding materials. This acoustic signal has a signal spectra in the range of megahertz at its origin, but the acoustic signal also suffers, similar to the electromagnetic, from the fact that the signal strength measured with piezo sensors on the transform take strongly depend on the travel path as well as the materials involved. And also, similar to the electromagnetic measurement, the acoustic measurement cannot be correlated with the amount of discharge and cannot be calibrated in terms of picocoulombs. Instead, the acoustic signals are mainly used for location of partial discharge sources. Let's take a look at a, some examples of these where here we have a short overview of the different types, uh, the different signal types First, we have the electrical pulse that's taken from a test tap at a bushing. And we can notice the nice clean signal and nice clean oscillations. Next, we have the electromagnetic pulse or UHF partial discharge pulse that's taken from a UHF antenna at the oil valve. And notice the increased noise from the high frequency effects and this heavy oscillations. Finally, we have the acoustic signal received by piezo sensors at the tank wall. And looking at the oscilloscope, sh oscilloscope sh uh, shot here, the electric partial discharge pulse as seen here is used for triggering. And while this trigger uh, travels with the speed of light, the acoustic signals seen here in red, blue, and green travel roughly with the speed of 1400 to 1600 meters per second in oil. Therefore, if we know the distance of the sensor to the partial discharge, we can use these time delays to figure out the actual distance. So you have the reference signal you have the velocity and the distance, or the delay rather, the time delay, which would offer you to find the distance between the, the sensors and the partial discharge origin. Now partial discharges are measured in picocoulombs and for a simple pass fail test, the meter shown would be sufficient where it just shows the magnitude of the partial discharge in picocoulombs. However, compared to the meter view, we have the early scope view that offers a little bit more diagnostic ability, but really uh, is limited in its analysis. The last picture shows the commonly used phase resolved partial discharge pattern we had covered previously. Taking a look at this, uh, we can tell by the partial discharge pattern um, that we have voids by these arcs here. So, so we may have small gas inclusions or voids within our insulation. Not only do we know the type of defect in this case, but we also can count how many we have by the number of arcs. So one, two, three, four, maybe five or six within the insulation. And this really highlights the benefit of phase resolved partial discharge patterns for in-depth interpretation. Now let's take a step from the factory acceptance testing and take a look at the ICM system. The ICM system is an advanced partial discharge det uh, detection system and analysis tool that's capable of simultaneous real-time acquisition at the 10 channels. Comes equipped with an integrated spectrum analysis up to 10 megahertz capable of narrow and band, uh, wide bandwidths of nine and 300 kilohertz. It's capable of time domain analysis as well as measurements in both AC and DC voltages, as well as comes with the integrated acoustic partial discharge location functions. It also has its own advanced software 
including the uh, acceptance testing software that we'll cover. It comes equipped with high resolution phase resolved partial discharge pattern, a powerful suppression and input sensitivity is IEC 6270 compliant. And as we'll cover is co capable of factory measurements. And as your own, my, my uh, colleague will cover is capable of field measurements as well. Here we have an example of a test setup where the standard decoupling unit uses either the measuring impedance connected to a bushing tap or this quadrupole or the use of a coupling capacitor. However, there are some cases where a high frequency current transformer would be useful by maybe using it for noise gating or for decoupling the signal on a neutral. Next, you have your preamplifier, which is connected directly behind the decoupling unit. And this is used to perform early signal amplification together with an impedance conversion from a high input impedance that offers high signal availability down to 50 ohms that allows for the signal transmission through RG, uh, RG58 or coax cable. So the high input impedance allows for strong signal and the amplification allows for that signal transmission with the 50 ohm termination through the uh, coax cable. And this can spare the need for fiber optic transmission as a basic noise suppression technique. As we know, fiber optic is, is uh, sensitive and can break very easily if stepped on or bent. The preamplifier is then connected to the instrument itself in this case, the ICM system, which is available in a half 19 inch version with up to four channels as seen here, or uh, up the full 19 inch system with available up to 10 channels as seen here. Now let's cover a couple of configurations for both power transformers and distribution transformers. The minimum configuration for power transformers resembles that of the requirement to measure up to six bushings in parallel with compliance to the IEC 676-3. So, the 19 inch acquisition with six, channel, six acquisition channels, a preamplifier, quadrupole, and together with the uh, partial discharge calibrator are necessary to perform this measurement. Alternatively, you can go beyond this and go to a full configuration that adds the spectrum analyzer option as well as the smart trigger for enhanced acoustic location and adds the extra channels up to a 10 channel instrument that allows for measurement uh, of the tertiary as well as the neutral um, with adding your, your high frequency current transformer as well. <clears throat> Here we have the minimum configuration for distribution transformers that requires only measurements on your three acquisition channels as we discussed. So the half inch 19 rack was sufficient together with the uh, preamplifier, coupling capacitor and partial discharge calibrator. But since the acceptance limit for distribution transformers is 10 picocoulombs, it's recommended to use the CT100 or the high frequency CT, even if the signal is not gated, but filtered later on, the CT100 is an effective tool to identify the origin of disturbances. Moving away from the hardware, let's take a look at the software utilized by the ICM system, where the ICM system has three main display modes. The first mentioned is the sing, uh, single channel panel. When it comes to transformer testing, the single panel channel or the single channel panel is used um, to actually, or not to actually test, but to adapt and optimize the settings to suit the situation for your test lab or for in-depth research in case of a failed acceptance test. The second main display mode is the multi-channel panel, giving a comprehensive overview of the last phase resolved partial discharge uh, patterns recorded on all your channels. The third display mode is your acceptance test panel which is an operation mode dedicated for, to perform factory acceptance testing of transformers. As you can see, you can see the volt, applied voltage sequence of your 1.5 to your enhanced voltage and your hour long duration uh, test afterward. And we'll, we'll touch more on that later. The single channel panel has a, in total 12 different views and on top uh, uh, some additional pop-ups, but we're gonna focus on the views used during the tra fan, transformer factory acceptance test whether they be for optimizing the setup or afterward for fault research. First dimension is the scope view, as this is an early, was used by early partial discharge detectors and offers was one of the first views that offers not only the magnitude, but the phase as well. This was replaced by the phase resolved partial discharge display or the map display. The third view to mention is the spectrum view, which, gives, uh, which allows for 
the availability to look into the spectrum and find which frequency band would be the best to provide the, the greatest signal to noise ratio. And then the last mode is the oscilloscope view that gives information about the pulse shape and in case of multiple signals about the different tra uh, travel times. The acceptance test panel that uh, has been developed with the intention to provide more dedicated um, performance of fast and easy transformer factor acceptance tests. So here, the meters of all 10 channels are shown in parallel, where you have five on the left and five on the right. On top of that, the center display mode offers four switchable views, where the first is the table view that gives you the recorded values during the factory acceptance test. The next is a predefined strip chart that shows the measured voltages and partial discharge values for the first five channels up top and for the second five channels down bottom. Next, you have the live channel views that shows the partial discharge over time on the left graph for the first four channels and the voltage applied on the right uh, for the first four channels. However, the live chart can be freely configured. For instance, in this view, we have it configured to show just two channels, channels five and six, where we see the partial discharge and the applied voltage for channel five and the partial discharge and applied voltage for channel six. Now that we've talked about the ICM system let's, and factory acceptance testing, let's combine them and talk about factory acceptance testing with the ICM system. A common problem for any kind of partial discharge measurement is picking up on high frequency disturbances that are radiated by surrounding equipment during the partial discharge measurement. To understand why this is happening, let's look at the following points. First off, the, measurement, the, the measuring impedance is placed close to ground as seen here where the measuring impedance is directly under the capacitor and directly under the device under test. And basically this results in measurements of all high frequency signals that are picked up on the common ground connection. Secondly, the construction of many transformers, factory acceptance to, uh, partial discharge measurements were not really considered uh, common or not considered at the time, which led to the fact that there are often no separated ground systems for high voltage laboratories. So high frequency disturbances created from machinery used in the manufacturing affect the uh, sensitivity of the overall partial discharge measurement. Now to cope with this problem, the signal to noise ratio within the allowed frequency range is examined and optimized by evaluating the noise floor for the available filter combinations used during the typical test circuit, including the device under test. Now we, we're gonna to come to the individual steps to perform the induced voltage partial discharge test, breaking it up into the test setup and the test uh, execution. So to start, you would connect uh, all your instruments and accessories in the final configuration mode, perform your partial discharge or your RIV calibration, perform your linearity test to verify the partial discharge calibration, Dis disconnect all calibrators, and then secure the high voltage test area to perform the test. Once the test area is secured, you can start the recording on the software, apply your voltage and trigger and set your trigger values for partial discharge and voltage at their predefined levels. Perform the test for either the one hour or 180 seconds, making sure to set your auto trigger, wait until the voltage curve for the specified device under test is complete, and then create your factory acceptance report. Now taking a look at the test circuit, when performing the test on a power transformer, the connections look like shown. Over to the left, we have our power transformer with our bushings and our test taps down at the base here. From our test tap, we have our measurement impedance. Since the test tap is used to decouple the partial discharge activity, there's no need for the use of a uh, coupling capacitor. So we go into our measurement impedance. From our measurement impedance, we have our amplifier for our signal conditioning with our high input impedance and a 50 ohm termination that uses the coax cable to transmit the signal um, to our partial discharge instrument, in this case, the ICM system. In green and yellow, we have our common ground connection. And then you'll also notice these other blue lines here. Um, and they come from your quadrupole or your, hydro, your uh, measurement impedance here. And these are your high voltage synchronization. And it's important to note that without proper synchronization, the, partial, the phase resolved partial discharge patterns are useless because you can't overlie your, your applied voltage to the phase resolved partial discharge that you were receiving before. Now, also, I want to take a kind of closer look to give you a visualization of what's going on here. 
Looking at the test tap, you can see we're decoupling the partial discharge activity coming into the measurement impedance. We have our ground connection, and then directly out, we have our partial discharge out signal that goes into our preamplifier, and you can see uh, that conditions the signal. You can see the coaxial cable that comes to our ICM system, which is our acquisition. And then also, as I mentioned, the high voltage uh, synchronization coming out from the quadrupole or the measurement impedance as well, that would terminate at the acquisition as well. So that way you could apply or have your applied voltage synchronized with the phase resolved partial discharge pattern. Here we have a typical setup for distribution transformers. And as we mentioned before, um, since we don't have the availability of the test taps on our bushings, we now have to decouple using our coupling capacitors. So in this, in this image, we're decoupling from the terminal, applying to our coupling capacitor. We have our corona ring, the capacitor itself, and actually at the base of the capacitor is our measurement impedance. So all in one, we have the coupling capacitor and measurement impedance. From there, you can see here and here, we have our preamplifiers for signal conditioning and amplifying the signal for transmission. Then they come to the ICM system, which has four parallel channels um, and it, the remote control computer software for the ICM system. Now taking a look at calibration, <clears throat> partial discharge measurements are relative measurements and require calibration in accordance to the IEC 6270 standard. The calibration process is to compensate for the te overall test circuits attenuation and is done by injection of a calibration pulse with a well-defined magnitude and a magnitude adjustment of that response at the detector. So as seen in the image here, we have our transformer. We apply the, the calibrator to the top of the bushing and to our ground potential, and we can calibrate, we can inject our well-known, our well-defined magnitude pulse and then calibrate based on that. And you can see an image of a, of, of a gentleman performing that on a, a bushing here. Again, I wanna highlight this, that the, the calibration is valid for the test set in its final arrangement at the specified detection bandwidth, as well as the calibration magnitude. Also, um, the ICM system has, as we've said, its own uh, acceptance testing software and offers a calibration matrix that we'll look at on the next slide. So kind of highlighting the calibration, here we have another image of a calibration. We can see the calibrator again, uh, uh, tie, uh, tied to the top of the bushing and down to the ground and also notice that everything is, your final configuration is in place with your measurement impedance. You have your decoupling at the bushing tap and then your preamplifier. Once you're connected, you can inject the specified calibration value. Open your calibration panel. We're set to inject 500 picocoulomb. You can see we haven't started calibrating yet, so we don't have any values. You, in, you calibrate with the specified charge. So you can see at the U phase, we've injected 500 picocoulomb, and we can actually see the distribution of that through the other phases as well. Then you open up your linearity test panel to perform the linearity test to verify the calibration procedure. Once that's done, you repeat for the next phases and you'll get a cross coupling calibration matrix that looks like this. Again, where you have your, your injection and your uh, reference to the other, the other phases as well. And additional RIV calibrations should be performed if required. And then in some cases, a dedicated phase resolved partial discharge calibration is necessary. Looking at the, the test sequence from the, the terms of the, the software, we start the recording. So we have our, our uh, acceptance testing software, te acceptance test panel open. We turn on our high voltage and then we set our trigger values, including the elevated voltage either manually, as we've seen here, so we have the record mode manually, and that, or you can set it to automatic and remove any values that you don't want after. So you have an auto mode and you can see X's and, and some Blake spaces where you can remove some of the not needed values afterward. Now, when reaching the 180 second or one hour period, use the auto trigger, making as seen here where we have the drop down, set it to auto, making sure to set the trigger interval with the appropriate length depending on the transformer being tested whether it's the distribution transformer or power transformer and next in the case of, of partial discharge recording you simply press the button at the right corner for instance right here on this channel it's you can choose it on any channel and this starts the phase resolve partial discharge recording in the background or see or you press the button or you can even choose to have a pop-up in a separate window such as this where you have 
your phase resolve partial discharge pattern being taken place during the measurement. Then you just continue with the applied voltage sequence until the specified curve is complete. Stop and save your measurement and you're done with the test. Once in the case of a past partial discharge test, the only thing left now is pre preparation of documentation about the performed induced voltage test. And here we have two options. First is a somewhat uh, raw data export in terms of Word, HTML, or text files. And this allows you to easily import the measurement data into your own report template. Now, the second option is a ready to go report where here you can offer um, or edit the header and footer content itself and create a comprehensive neat report about the test that would end up looking something like this. So to summarize what we've covered, partial discharge is a breakdown of a small area of the overall installation where the, each avalanche generates three different measurable signals such as the local displacement current pulse, electromagnetic pulse, and acoustic signals. There are numerous standards that address factory acceptance testing for power transformers and distribution transformers, distinguishing via the rating and whether they're dry type or oil immersed transformers. And this includes strict test circuits, acceptance criteria, as well as the voltage sequence. Finally, the ICM system is available in multiple configurations to fit factory acceptance testing of distribution and power transformers, and offers the highlight of having the acceptance test panel software to aid in your factory acceptance testing. All righty, thank you very much, everybody. And questions? Yep, we'll jump on into our question and answer segment here. Uh, just as a reminder to everyone, we will have our second presentation uh, short, immediately after our Q&A session here. So please stick around for that. We don't want you to miss out on any important information. So we're gonna jump right on into it. Our first question I'm going to direct to Jerome. Um, Jerome, as per IEC standards, what are acceptable values for a partial discharge test? Yeah, I think that uh, Charles has uh, properly uh, explained the uh, acceptance criteria according to the uh, relevant IEC standards, so the 600763. Uh, for power transformers, the uh, limit has been um, set to 250 picocoulombs and looking at cost resin uh, distribution transformers the limitation is 10 picocoulomb so both uh, both levels um, are recently updated especially the one for power transformers was previously uh, 500 pc and it has been um, it was for a measurement at 1.5 times um maximum voltage for equipment but the recent standards have actually now been referring to um, uh, rated voltage instead of maximum voltage for equipment and today the power transformer test is done at 1.58 times rated voltage with a reduced um, acceptance level down to 250 picocoulomb and the background noise level limitation for such tests is defined at 50 pc thank you uh, additionally the next question will be for you does PDIX only provide the PD detection system or do they offer complete solutions for transformer testing laboratories? Yeah, that's a good one. So um, our main uh, core business is of course the development and manufacturing of uh, PD detection, detection systems and all uh, accessories required to decouple signals. But yes, uh, we also look into the full picture. So uh, we do for instance have a broad range of uh, high voltage filters in order to block noise coming from motor generator test sets or for converter-based test systems. Um, so we, we do have a, a lot of additional accessories which complement the PD equipment. And that's, uh, I think, what makes us uh, strong in the market that we look at the full setup. Thank you. Uh, and Jerome, since the UHF PD measurement has no reference, how reliable are the measurements? Yeah, the UHF measurements, um, they don't have a calibration as the HF measurements according to the IEC 6270. So um, what is generally the approach with UHF sensors is of, of course we are detecting in a higher bandwidth, so the coverage is generally less. But to ensure that uh, we can acquire some signal from inside, it's highly recommended to at least have two or three UHF antennas in the drain valves or in the flanges where uh, where there is um, 
where actually the boot position allows installing them and to perform a sensitivity check that's actually injecting uh, a UHF signal with uh, with a charge in injector such as a Cal2B for instance um, in one antenna and you see then the response on the other antennas so if you know that for instance you're injecting the maximum magnitude on a sensor on top of the tank and you um, receive a signal uh, on, uh, on the opposite side on the bottom you know you can actually um, have a good sensitivity or a detection, detection sensitivity from signals going across through the transformer. But uh, again, there is no calibration. We are not measuring in terms of picocoulomb. Uh, UHF measurements we uh, we do we measure in dB microvolt, and uh, it's correct. There is no reference. But what we do recommend is the sensitivity check from sensor to sensor, and that says you something about the coverage. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, Charles, is there any harm in taking measurements beyond one megahertz? So this kind of um, piggybacks right off of Jerome's answer um, and the fact that, no, there's not really any harm beyond taking measurements or make, taking measurements beyond one megahertz, but it depends on the mode in which you're testing. So as Jerome touched on, the UHF measurement would be done with UHF sensors and cannot be calibrated. Instead, you can perform what is called, as he said, the sensitivity check. Um, so if you're measuring via the conventional test method using the coupling capacitor with measurement impedance test circuit in accordance to the IEC 6270 standard, you would want to keep the, the measurement within those bandwidths, which would be below, below or at one megahertz. So there's no harm being done. It just depends on what you're trying to accomplish and what, which measurement is being performed at that point. All right, thank you. Uh, so, Jerome, does the ICM system support PD using bandpass filtering? Uh, yeah, definitely. So, the ICM system covers both uh, PD acquisition in bandpass band filter mode as well as uh, an embedded spectrum analyzer. What is uh, the advantage, of course, um, to have this? Uh, uh, bandpass filter is, is fully described in the IEC 6270 that a quasi, quasi integration like this, like this is nicely, nicely explained should be done using a bandpass filter circuit and that's of course the reason why we do have that in the system to be compliant with the 6270 today with the uh, with the last available uh, amendment it is not yet defined that it is accepted to use um, either uh, analog or digital filtering, uh, digital uh, spectrum analyzers to do a PD measurement uh, for acceptance mode. So um, these techniques, they definitely provide good results, but strictly evaluating the IEC 6270, there's only defined that a valid setup consists of a bandpass filtering circuit. All right, thank you. Uh, Charles, what is the difference or advantage to using a preamp and coaxial cable versus fiber optics? That's a good question, Michael. So the preamplifier offers early signal amplification as well as has a high input impedance um, to increase the signal strength. Um, also, the preamplifier has a, a 50 ohm termination that allows the, the transmission through coax cable, and this allows for a larger, a, lar a stronger signal strength across a longer uh, travel path, and also avoids the necessity to use the fiber optics. Fiber optics are, are typically used for noise immunity, but they are typically more expensive and definitely way more fragile um, than coaxial cables. So if performing the measurement, um, even in a laboratory environment, uh, if you step on that or you have a bend or you get a snag, you could have a broken fiber, and then you have to replace that fiber. Um, so fiber optics are, can be a pain, um, and especially in, in field environments where you would perform on-site measurements where you don't have the luxury of maybe having uh, you know, specified runs for your fiber optics. All right, thanks. Uh, Jerome, how can PD be positive in the, uh, uh, in the position for a half cycle? Uh, you mean positive PD in the uh, in the positive cycle? Well, 
basically, if you look in the literature, there is only discussed about uh, the first and third quarter for PD to occur. However, if the internal electrical field already turns polarity before reaching the zero crossing, that means you can already have an internal negative electrical field in a gas inclusion or a void before you reach the zero crossing. And that means the corresponding PD can effectively already be positive, uh, even while we are not in a negative cycle. So that just concerns the internal electrical field, which is already which which already swapped polarity before reaching the zero crossing. Thank you. Uh, so Charles, is the ICM system compatible with all accessories? As a matter of fact, yes. Um, the ICM system is a uh, is is compatible with all accessories, and that's one of the advantages of of the ICM system as it's capable of in-depth analysis because it is capable of not only performing the measurement in accordance to the IEC 6270 standard using the the uh, coupling capacitor with a measurement impedance uh, um, test circuit, but also is capable of utilizing UHF sensors um, and piezoelectric sensors that can be, or piezo sensors that can be used for uh, both acoustic measurements as well as uh, electromagnetic measurements. So the ICM system can perform all three of the measurements that were discussed in the presentation as far as uh, acoustic, which can be used for actual partial discharge location. And I believe my colleague will touch on that in the next presentation. Uh, so stick around for that, but also supports the conventional test method as well as um, the electromagnetic uh, UHF measurements. All right, thanks. And speaking of our next presentation, I think we have time for one last question. I'm going to give it to you, Charles. Uh, what is the accuracy of ICM systems? So the input sensitivity of the ICM system is uh, 0.02 picocoulomb. So it, the ICM system is a highly accurate system for partial discharge detection. Uh, so definitely, um, like I, as I highlighted, uh, one of the, the more in-depth uh, analysis tools for partial discharge detection. All right, thank you. So with that, I think we're out of time for a question answer session for our first segment, but if we didn't answer your question live, we will be reaching out to you offline in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Jerome, are you ready to uh, receive control for your presentation? Yeah, definitely. All right, here we go. Beautiful. All right, and with that, I will hand control over to you. Start whenever you are ready. Yeah, thank you very much, Charles, for the uh, introduction into factory acceptance testing and all relevant standards. It was a brief and good overview. The uh, second presentation of uh, this webinar will concern generally the um, on-site PD testing and fault location measurements on power transformers and distribution units. Um, so it will cover all aspects to do the same what Charles has explained in the factory acceptance test laboratory, but on site. All right, that was a small issue with taking over control. Looking at the presentation's outline of today, I'm discussing briefly um, PD and transformers in general, followed by uh, an introduction into on-site testing of power and distribution transformers. Of course, to do on-site testing, we require AC mobile test systems. A few insights uh, in that are explained in the third chapter. Uh, Four chapter concerns generalities in relation to on-site uh, PD testing on, on big transformers. And the most interesting chapter definitely is the um, PD troubleshooting strategy and some case studies. We conclude with a few important conclusions in the summary of this presentation, and then I'm happy to answer all your remaining questions. Changing the slides is apparently a small issue. All right, here we go again. Chapter one concerns uh, PD in transformers. 
partial discharge phenomena in transformers have uh, several reasons and several root causes. First of all, um, if you have issues with the quality of your insulation materials, if they are inferior uh, to the to the field strength and so on, it can it can uh, cause partial discharge in quite short term. Other issues can be fundamental design problems, for instance, miscalculated internal electrical fields or overstraining of insulation components. Also important with uh, oil immersed transformers and as well as um, cast resin transformers is the processing, so the vacuum stage, the impregnating stage. Um, so if this is done incom incompletely, of course, it can cause partial discharge. A fourth group are uh, assembling related problems, just looking at uh, oil immersed transformers being transported to the, from the factory to the site. That's generally done without bushings mounted. And if something goes wrong with the bushing installation, you can have, for instance, uh, floating contacts or floating problems. Last but not least, we should not forget the humidity in oil. So if water starts to boil under the increasing winding temperatures, it can evaporate and in return cause um, air bubbles inside the oil which is then again a weak point and under an electrical field can start to discharge. What is actually the, the impact of PD in, in transformer insulation systems? First of all, um, we have to look at what is the, the discharge location and what is the kind, the, the, the nature and the type of PD which we have in the, in the main tank because that, that determines in general the severity. Secondly, if we have PD and it is not uh, well considered immediately, it causes accelerated degradation of insulation materials. When we have an accelerated uh, aging process, of course, we can uh, draw the, log the next logical consequence that we have a re reduced life expectancy of the grid system for this particular transformer. And the worst case scenario, that's something we definitely have to uh, try to avoid, an unexpected uh, uh, breakdown of, of the winding causing blackouts. The right hand picture on top uh, shows, for instance, uh, a case which I will explain at the end of the presentation, uh, where you see clearly uh, signs of arcing in a, um, in a winding cylinder. The image right on, uh, down here, over here, shows actually a failure of a cast resin transformer. This was a transformer of a wind turbine, usually uh, installed on top of the wind turbine under quite severe ambient conditions. And the unit was brought into the workshop for general cleaning. Um, the PD measurement was was actually requested and performed by the uh, by Power Diagnostics. It was a request from the insurance company, and we detected a uh, PD magnitude slightly above the uh, usual acceptance level. The advice of this for this transformer was also negative. Unfortunately, the transformer was installed back in uh, in the wind turbine and failed during one of the first uh, online switching activities. Second chapter of, or check, second slide of this uh, first chapter uh, concerns common root causes of PD. So what are practical examples, uh, effective practical reasons which we often see in the field? First of all, uh, inadequ inadequate vacuum stage prior to impregnation. Um, well, that's generally a problem in winter time um, when, for instance, the dew point cannot be reached or the vacuum stage has not been held long enough and the, the transformer is later on filled with oil, we can still have remaining gas inclusions. Another problem before oil impregnation is insufficient drying of the active part. So many techniques are available uh, to do that. Um, but when insufficiently done, we have still a high water content in the transformer, which will over time, uh, in, a very, in a very short time, also cause H2 generation in the oil. Another problem with what we frequently find or frequently experience is insufficient uh, filtering of the oil before it's entered in the transformer. And we do have uh, the risk of um, remaining conductive particles in the oil. Already discussed before was uh, increased water content in the oil and the increased, increased water content in the oil can not only cause additional voids by evaporating um, moisture, but we can also have the risk for a reduced breakdown uh, strength or breakdown voltage of the oil. This can properly be tested with the mega devices, just a quick test before the test to confirm that the breakdown strength was done, uh, it was, was properly, was good. Not only the, the breakdown strength of the um, oil in the main tank should be all right, but also the um, oil in the oil to sea compartment is important to test. 
in advance prior to anarchization. Another problem uh, what we uh, frequently see is uh, floating potential activities by static shields or corona rings inside just by missing electrical contacts. It does not really harm the transformer. It can co it can cause gassing, can cause gassing, but it will not harm the active part. And when the missing electrical connection is restored, the problem is also directly um, directly gone. OLTC issues. Well, very often in the OLTC compartment, uh, when DJ samples are taken, uh, there are signs of uh, C2H2 acetylene, and this is generally uh, also a contact problem causing um, high current arcing. In the uh, on the OLTC itself. Last but not least, uh, sometimes we uh, find with acoustic PD location attempts that a uh, stupid drop of cash and glue uh, remaining on sticks uh, separating uh, cylinders, for instance, um, are unlucky uh, placed in areas or positioned or located in areas with an elevated electrical field and causing a consequent um, Void spherical void discharge. Changing over the slides is apparently hanging a bit. All right. Chapter two of this presentation is a brief introduction into uh, on site testing of uh, transformers, um, why it should be done and how it is done. All right, here we are. So introduction into on-site testing. What we all uh, experience and what people of, from asset management definitely know is that we have all over the world an increased population of aged, aged substation uh, equipment. In the past, uh, so uh, what was happening with, with power transformers is that there were not really extended maintenance programs. Um, so one of the general um, things being discussed was, okay, there is no need for um, a maintenance strategy for static assets. They don't require any maintenance. Well, of course, that was not really a, a good conclusion. So. Um, there is a high number of, of power transformers where we are very uncertain about the condition, um, about their condition. And uh, another thing why we have an aged substation, increased population of aged substation equipment worldwide are um, delayed and cancelled investments by uh, deregulations of uh, power grid companies. So possible consequences of an unknown condition of a power transformer is of course an increased failure rate and risk um, what we at any time should try to avoid are unexpected outages causing uh, consequent long downtimes uh, and also of course associated safety and environmental risks. If a transformer fails the general repair time um, is, is a couple of months and transporting big units back to the factory is something that should be avoided at any time. So therefore, transformer maintenance strategies today um, have significantly improved. So there's different approach of, of uh, these kind of asset managements, which have defined new maintenance strategies that changed in from curative maintenance into predictive maintenance. So the philosophy of the condition-based maintenance, in fact, there has been search for uh, custom time-saving solutions. And the priority these days where all the maintenance steps are relying on is a dedicated uh, condition assessment Second slide concerning introduction into on-site testing. Well, basically uh, one of the cost saving solutions is basically the concept moving the factory to the site. That means testing and repairing at site, um, which is uh, of course a big advantage to reduce the downtimes. We avoid transporta transportation back to the factory and immediately um, the repair can start on site. What has been done on site these days is um, active part repairs, exchanging coils, what we also frequently experience is that uh, units get power upgrades, so improved cooling and so on. And these days, pretty common are oil treatments and uh, regeneration, which can even, even be done under online conditions. 
by the fact that we have this concept moving the factory to the site and that we are going to uh, spend more uh, the focus on to uh, repairs on site there is also an increasing demand for on-site testing uh, of power and distribution transformers uh, including pd measurements when do we need to perform uh, an on-site measurement well in the first place if critical components are being replaced on transformers at least a high voltage test is required a pd measurement can then confirm the performance of this repair also during the commissioning stage these days assurance companies are really pushing to get high voltage testing done at site uh, some of them even define also the pd measurement another opportunity or another reason to do uh, in that PD, pd investigation on site is um, the verification of uh, dj analysis for instance if h2 and ch4 are being reported that can be an indication of internal pd which can be verified by a measurement and in worst case we are being asked to verify uh, a trip of a or trigger of a buckles relay or a pd continuous a uh, PD monitoring system showing uh, alarm thresholds that have been exceeded. Of course, when we have to do this on-site testing activities, there is a requirement for compact mobile test systems. Um, well, they should be compact and lightweight to enhance and improve the uh, reaction time in terms of mobilization. And looking at um, what is happening today, we see actually mostly converter-based test sets, everything nicely embedded into one container. Of course, if we have to do the PD measurements, we need a powerful PD detection system uh, with all the relevant accessories to manage noisy conditions, for instance. Here on the uh, right-hand side, uh, we see some repair activities on site after a turn-to-turn -turn failure. And for instance, here on the right-hand side, we see a continuous monitoring system from Power Diagnostics, which is directly in contact with the uh, ABB Tech Transformer overall monitoring system where the PD levels are just being transmitted to the uh, global transformer um, monitoring system. Sorry for this mishap, but I cannot swap the files or the slides properly. Arriving at chapter three, we'll discuss about the uh, mobile test systems, which are these days being used for um, on-site testing activities. Basically, uh, when testing power transformers, there are two types of power supplies being used. And in the factory acceptance test laboratories, it's generally a motor generator test set. Uh, however, using these kind of equipment on-site is not really flexible. So the systems are generally large and bulky everything is distributed in in multiple containers uh, that being said in in regards to weight and dimensions there are some other uh, critical limitations first of all motor generator test sets are generally um, operating at fixed frequency that means we cannot play with the frequency um, to drive um, drive to drive them up to the self-compensating frequency so that means optimization of the power demand just by adjusting the frequency is difficult that means definitely uh, a large inductive and capacitive compensation is required to cover bigger units. That means um, motor generator test sets, uh, they provide a three-phase system and uh, running a three-phase system in imbalance works just up to say 20, 25% of the power, power rating. Um, but that means also when we have to test uh, single phase transformers or sing perform single phase induced voltage tests, there might be some limitations when the Steinmetz circuit is not available with the motor generator test set. Typical uh, background noise you can expect from a motor generator test set are diode and thyristor firing from the excitation, showing here the six pulses nicely distributed um, with a phase position difference of 60 degrees. What is today really in and um, what is frequent, most frequently used in, in, in portable, in, in, in um, mobile test systems are electronic power supplies. So based on uh, power converters with IGBTs, it's a very good and compact system but it's quite flexible for mobilization. And the, the, the thing is that everything is embedded into one single container. What is the most powerful thing with an IGBT or with a converter-based test system is its, its uh, ability to vary the frequency. That means looking at the transformer circuit, which is basically an RLC circuit, we can tune that into resonance or set in a different way, tune it, in, tune it into this, its um, uh, self-compensating frequency 
the point at, at which the um, uh, uh, capacitive reactive power is cancelled by the inductive reactive power and only the resistive losses are required to be injected. So that's a great advantage. We can play with the frequency and optimize the total power demand to a minimum. There is also an opportunity to synchronize multiple of these units to test really large units. And what you can see here on the right hand side is actually the um, typical uh, switching noise that comes from the uh, converters, of course, the unfiltered noise. The power diagnostics AC mobile test system is rated uh, 1.3 MVA, which is one of the most powerful uh, driving around here in, in, in Europe. It consists of the heart of the system consists of uh, three 450 kVA uh, power converters with a variable frequency from 15 to 200 Hertz. Everything here in these cabinets uh, is uh, water cooled with an external heat exchanger. Behind the uh, converter cabinets, we do have uh, a small inductive and capacitive compensation, which we almost never use, as we can tune the system into, into self-compensating stage by varying the frequency. In the uh, back compartment, we do have a, a matching or step-up transformer offering multiple taps, steps of high voltage, low current, or high current, low voltage, which uh, is really uh, very well optimized um, step up transformer to meet a wide range or to, to meet the criteria for a wide range of um, transformers in the field. Actually, this um, step up transformer is uh, one big tank containing of three single phase uh, transformers. And this offers us, of course, the uh, advantage that we can operate uh, phases in parallel, in series, anti series. Uh, so we have a very good flexibility here with the converters and with the step up transformer. Its rating is 2 MVA, that means we only have 1.3 MVA available, but that also means that there's room for quite some uh, additional uh, capacitive or inductive compensation ex to be connected er uh, externally in parallel to the transformer windings. In order to come down in noise floor, we do have uh, three high frequency uh, filters over here, which block then the entirely the switching noise coming from the IGBTs passing through the transformer. The transformer already introduces a certain damping, but we fine tune the background noise level or overall noise floor here with the three filters in the backside. They are suited for, uh, for 100 kV and 123 amps. Last but not least, we have a 500, and 500 kV uh, series resonant reactor at the back of the container, which moves out with a ramp for applied or separate source AC which stand voltage tests up to 500 kilovolts. The power intake of the system is just a 400 volt auxiliary supply generally provided by an external diesel generator. And here in the control room, we have of course all required equipment to do advanced PD testing, as well as a power analyzer to measure lo uh, load losses and no load losses. A few uh, pictures of our test system. So first of all, here we have the, uh, the control room with on top fiber optic uh, transmission system. Why do we have a fiber optic transmission system? As you can see here in the uh, line filters, we do have an embedded CT and voltage divider given by the 10 nanofarad damping capacitor and the quadrupole or the divider capacitor here in that box. For the voltage measurement, there's not really a concern, but the uh, current measurement is taken at high voltage potential and therefore we need a galvanic separation and that's arranged here by the fiber optic transmission system. We do have a, a 10 channel parallel PD detection, PD, PD detection system, uh, our ICM system as already uh, explained in detail by my colleague in the first chapter. So we have 10 channels available uh, to cover also the on-site measurements similar like in factory environment. Of course, we have the industrial precise to have the uh, PD and inverter control software. And finally, our panner, pa uh, power analyzer to monitor all parameters, no load losses, currents, voltages, power factors, and so on. A few insights here are a few impressions of our step-up transformer where you see the external bushings and the external connectors just to change the taps. And here our uh, line filters with the power cable connected. The power intake at the side of the container seen with plug and play power locks very convenient to connect and here you can see an example of our 500 kV reactor with the ramp on the beams here moved out for an applied voltage test
One impression of an on-site uh, measurement that we, we have done in the past was um, uh, applied voltage testing, 500 kV AC on 660 MVA current limiting reactors. That was uh, just applied voltage testing after installation. So we used our series uh, resonant test system for this application. Um, here we had to perform um, three applied voltage tests, one for each phase. And you can see here the reactor has been set up for the central phase. Uh, we have a PD-free connection made between the reactor and the uh, high voltage bushing, where we also have a large corona ring. So actually this setup was uh, pretty okay to um, also perform um, an, a PD measurement under applied voltage. Actually the criteria for this test was just pass or fail, so it was not based on PD measurements, uh, but that was a precondition to energize the system. And here we supported um, OEM company. Here again, the focus on the uh, PD-free high voltage connection. And uh, later on, while discussing that, discussing that job, we found out that satellite pictures were taken by Google during the time we were performing the measurement at site. So we nicely have our test system in the substation on Google Maps. Another nice project was um, site acceptance testing of three entirely new built transformers. And these uh, transformers were entirely um, assembled on site. So you see here the, uh, the tent where it was done to have a uh, uh, continuous climate and controlled temperature conditions and humidity. So this was a project in the uh, Haute Alps in the southeast of France and there in the mountains was a weight limitation uh, which actually avoided that um, uh, we could mobilize or trans transfer the transformer entirely uh, assembled to the substation. So even the core was stacked on site, a very unique and prestigious project. Uh, the coils, they were manufactured in the transformer factory and then, of course, uh, just uh, sent over to the to the site. But basically, the entire core stacking, assembling, vacuum process, oil impregnation was all done at site. And the unit was a 220 kV, 60, 220 kV to 66 kV uh, transformer, rating 185 MVA. And of course, uh, with this activity, it was required to uh, to test this transformer according to standards, but on site. So the first test uh, to be carried out was the AC withstand voltage test. So we see here again the uh, the reactor uh, corona rings already fitted, so the high voltage bushings short circuited to the neutral. So we performed a, a AC withstand voltage test on the high voltage, on the low voltage winding, including neutral, uh, a low voltage winding, and a high voltage, including the neutral terminal. The uh, next test was um, single phase induced voltage testing. So um, because of the 66 kV uh, voltage level on the LV, we had to reach the uh, UM level, 245 kV, um, by single phase induced voltage testing because we just lacked sufficient power to do it in three phase mode, but no problem. That was, in, uh, was discussed with the customer to do it first of all in single phase mode to excite and to stress the winding at this voltage level. And then later on, we prepared the setup for a three phases induced voltage test. Of course, the PD measurements have been performed. And as you can see here, the one hour PD measurement uh, was entirely clean. The few spikes uh, which showed up on all phases simultaneously was just some external ambient noise, which of course uh, is uh, not entirely to be controlled on site, but the background noise level in this respect was less than 50 picocoulombs, so pretty good condition for an on-site test. Followed by the PD measurement where the uh, no load losses, of course, uh, important for the, for the owner. Uh, to see if the guaranteed no load loss was eff effectively achieved, and that was also perfect. The, uh, the uh, following test were load losses, or say, say it in a different way, impedance voltage measurement. So we did not went up to the uh, full short circuit current, but the, no the load losses were measured up to 10% of the rated short circuit current in the, um, in the principal tap and the two outer taps. And actually, the entire project for the three transformers was completed successfully. So a very unique and prestigious project. Looking at the uh, distribution transformers and more specifically the uh, cast resin transformers, there is a very high increasing demand to assess these units on site. The uh, polymeric insulated cast resin transformers, they however do have a very low acceptance level, just 10 picocoulombs. So achieving uh, these kind of 
test conditions on site uh, requires definitely a power supply that provides a, a clean sine wave, which is preferably uh, a frequency variable in frequency and lightweighted and compact. Just think over wind turbines, for instance, going up in the wind turbine to test to do a PD test, you cannot go up with a large and bulky power supply. So recently we have been performing tests with the Trax 220 made in uh, made by Megro Sweden, which is a multifunctional substation test equipment, including uh, power factoring capacitance uh, accessories, so the TDX 120 up to 12 kilovolt. But the uh, main control source, so the Trax itself, comes with a variable frequency uh, converter-based uh, power supply with a rated continuous power of 3.5 kVA and 5, and 5 kVA peak power. The auxiliary output of the system provides 250 uh, volts up to 25 amps and can actually be used in combination with a step-up transformer to perform single-phase induced voltage tests on dry type transformers. Of course, with specific specific uh, load ranges, so units up to 2.5 to 3 MVA should be fine. Typically, the no load losses of these units are in the range of 1.5 to 2 kilowatts. So it can perfectly be done with the 3.5 kVA continuous power of the embedded converter. Um, interesting, of course, by the variable frequency is that we can also tune the system into, into resonance. So basically, we have the uh, inductance to the core and the capacitance of the coil to earth. Uh, that means we have the LC circuit, um, which is then, in fact, a parallel resonance circuit. And uh, by varying the frequency, we uh, can tune the circuit into resonance which means again that the capacitive and inductive reactive power cancel out each other and only the resistive losses are required to be injected. So the combination here of the uh, ICM system, powerful advanced PD detection system, multi-channel PD system in combination with the tracks really uh, shows the good synergies between the power diagnostics and mega products. How does the setup work? Basically we have, uh, we have the tracks, its auxiliary output up to 250 volts AC. Um, after the tracks, we have a, a sign filter and a high frequency filter to block any remaining noise coming from the internal uh, converters of the tracks. We have a, a step-up transformer, a matching transformer, uh, in order to have the uh, correct voltage for the LV. We do single phase induced voltage test. That means we induce single phase voltage as well in the HV and decouple by the conventional circuit, coupling capacitor, preamplifier, and ICM system, the uh, PD activity. Um, well, the uh, setup was found to be really clean. So if you look at the spectrum here between the two uh, cursors is the area defined by IEC. The signal to noise ratio just of a calibrator pulse and the remaining noise floor from the from the tracks was really good. So we could achieve a sensitivity below five picocoulomb, which is for on-site uh, really good, I would say, and definitely acceptable to assess these units on-site. Arriving at chapter number four, we'll discuss about uh, generalities in relation to on-site uh, PD tests, both on uh, power transformers as dry type units. If we look at uh, on-site testing, we have two different approaches. Um, one are the site acceptance tests, tests according to factory standards, or we try to approach the uh, defined criteria in factory standards. But uh, very challenging is that we have no shielded test environment and that we need to set up the test room at each different site again, which means we have to do optimizations, we have to uh, look at the noise floor, do improved filtering, change ground connections. Um, and we, of course, have to uh, maintain the criteria of 250 uh, picocoulomb uh, detection level and the background noise of 50 PC. Well, meeting this 50 PC is a demanding task. Uh, but generally, from experience, we can uh, stay below 100, 135 picocoulomb, which is still acceptable to find uh, discharge levels in the range of 250 PC. Here you see, for instance, uh, an example of a side acceptance test being performed, so the one-hour PD measurement, including the short enhancement level. And here, obviously, um, one of the phases did not meet the criteria and exceeded the uh, 250 picocoulomb acceptance level. Also, the PD did not disappear throughout the test, even in the last 20 minutes there was no extinction, so this transformer failed the test. The other tests are uh, tests uh, with diagnostic approach. So these are tests where we have no restrictions by standards. We are free to select the energization mode, free to, to select the bandwidth. Um, we can probably also add uh, 
to the UHF and or VHF and acoustic uh, signal decoupling to the conventional circuit. And a calibration is even not mandatory for us in this uh, in this approach. What is important with this kind of measurement is to locate and to find the discharge activity. And uh, with the site acceptance test, we have to meet the um, factory acceptance test criteria. So basically, the, the test circuits have a lot of uh, similarities, but the evaluation approach is different. If we have to move the test room on site, uh, we of course have to consider many things in order to tune the circuit into a decent uh, sensitivity for the detection of PD activity. So in general, uh, what has been done on the on the high voltage and medium voltage bushing, we fit corona electrodes. Um, yeah, well, if we can already avoid corona just by fitting the electrode, we do not need to spend time with filtering and gating. Um, so this is standard been done. The uh, power is provided or injected using shielded medium voltage power cables. So we, we have absolutely need to make sure that no one is, is touching the connections and therefore definitely we need uh, shielded cables and also to, um, to ensure that we have uh, noise management and no external radiation from noise to the, uh, via these cables into the test circuit. Definitely um, high voltage uh, filters like shown here, T100 filters. To, um, to block actually the, the converter switching noise. Uh, and what of course sometimes is uh, a big problem is external corona on overhead lines that are being live, like here for instance in the picture, where you clearly see there is no shielding available uh, and external corona then radiating into our setup. So these are things to be discussed. Uh, so ideally um, overhead lines passing the transformer on a test or neighboring transformers without corona rings are um, in, sh shut off for a short time during the tests. A very powerful tool, what we absolutely have to use and evaluate every measurement again, is uh, spectrum analysis. So to make a clear evaluation of the signal to noise ratio, which is different in each and every substation. Uh, sometimes we have to agree small deviations from the um, uh, defined bandwidth from the IEC 6270, but mostly we make it within the IEC 6270 frequency boundaries. The uh, standard setup consists uh, of uh, a quadrupole fitted with a preamplifier as shown on the left hand side on top. Um, you would say, oh, we have no coupling capacitor. Well, the coupling capacitor is being formed by the C1 and C2 of the condenser bushing. And then we have a matched um, uh, quadrupole based on the C1 and C2 and also a matched voltage divider. Here again, we have the uh, preamplifier directly fitted to the quadrupole which uh, allows us to directly do signal treatment there where the signal enters the circuit. And we focus on high impedance signal, signal decoupling, which uh, enhances the input sensitivity. And again, as Charles already explained very well, the cable length is less critical and we don't have the need for expensive fiber optic uh, systems, which are pretty sensitive. Imagine that you have to cross over transformers to run over transformers for the calibration while touching the fiber optic cable uh, can harm the cable immediately. And this is absolutely not the case with a rugged coaxial cable. Uh, on the left-hand side below, we see then the uh, PD calibration being done uh, shortly before uh, energizing uh, the setup. Another picture over here is an on-site test on a cast resin transformer in the metal enclosure with coupling capacitor and a high voltage filter. So here we need to come down as low as possible in noise level, looking at uh, yeah, the 10 PC um, uh, acceptance level for dry type transformers. On the right hand side, we have a nice picture of an on site test on a, on a 400 kV to 220 auto transformer. Here again, with the corona electrodes on top of the bushing from the high voltage winding and the medium voltage winding, and the required power was injected via the tertiary bushings. Of course, we also do have numerous um, additional decoupling methods. Uh, first of all, here with the, with the GSU was a measurement on a, on a big single phase generator step-up transformer. We could just simply fit uh, coupling capacitors as these CC35B uh, to the um, low voltage terminals. On the other hand, we have uh, a lot of uh, possibilities to decouple signal with HFCTs, for instance, on transformers where we have oil cable box terminations and where we don't have an external access to the test step. Yeah, a possibility is to decouple then the signal with an high frequency current transformer on the cable termination. The same way we can use a CT in the main grounding and the neutral ground return, which generally offers 
excellent signal um, when it comes to internal PD. Here on the third picture, we see a combination of uh, UHF signal detection, so a UHF antenna installed in a transformer and directly here fitted uh, on the left and right hand side acoustic sensor. So here the um, acoustic triangulation was done based on an electrical trigger signal provided by by uh, a UHF uh, antenna. The UHF may then limit definitely the coverage to find problems from deep inside, but it complements the setup when it comes to diagnostic approach. When we have the requirement for an electrical trigger, it doesn't matter if it comes from a coupling capacitor, from a CT, or from a UHF sensor. So we're already happy to have an electrical trigger signal as reference. Bottom picture below here shows three acoustic sensors in a row uh, in the strategy uh, to locate um, PD inside the transformer by acoustic PD detection, which will be explained um, in the last chapter. We also do have some uh, disturbance antenna, antennas to acquire external corona to be fed into the gating uh, module. And here you see again our TVS2 transformer valve sensor. In addition, we have here the UHF transformer flange sensor. Um, which are both methods to decouple signals in UHF mode. If an offline measurement cannot be facilitated, for instance, by the inavailability of a mobile test system, and there is an urgent need for a confirmation of an internal PD source after a DGA, uh, poor DGA result, for instance, there's also the opportunity to attempt to do an online uh, measurement. Uh, usually, um, we have them permanently fitted bushing adapters and bushing coupling units, uh, which is actually the pre-setup to, uh, to do continuous monitoring over time. However, we can also temporarily fit quadruples and conduct a calibration. But if we use the grid for energization, um, definitely the, um, the boot permanently installed bushing adapter and bushing coupling unit are a way safer solution. Um, if you have the opportunity to select the energization method, then I recommend in this case to do a backfeed from the LV grid system. That allows us to disconnect the uh, high voltage uh, line system and to reduce the, the, the corona on these lines. Um, we generally fit also corona rings to these bushings uh, and that allows us to have a decent sensitivity on the 400 kV side. Up to 110 kV corona is less critical, but again, uh, typical auto transformers, 400 kV to 220 kV. Um, there you can already save a lot of time just by optimizing the setup instead of um, playing with the noise reduction all the time. Um, definitely with such online measurement, spectrum analysis is the required tool uh, because if you look at an online spectrum, uh, it contains possible PD but also external signals and we need to be able to separate them uh, very properly to make the right conclusion. And such online measurements, as you can see here in the pattern, they provide a mixture of, of numerous things, sometimes external signals or sometimes multiple signals coming from inside. So this uh, kind of measurements require quite high, high level of operator knowledge. Uh, we perform these uh, measurements also with the same ICM system. Here you see the four channel variant, but of course, as Charles already explained, we can provide the system up to 10 channels parallel. How to manage noise on site? Well, we have sometimes only the possibility to do noise reduction and on the other side also the possibility to do completely elim eliminated noise reduction. For instance, if we have converter switching, uh, we try to reduce the magnitude already by introducing filtering in the first stage. And if the filter cannot manage uh, to blind out the entire noise, we have to um, use gating in combination. So a combination of filtering and gating where we could come down to a decent background noise level. Full noise elimination, elimination even without filtering, is certainly um, in most of the cases possible where we do uh, have to, cover, uh, to cope with noise from a motor generator test set. So for instance, this diode switching or thyristor firing, this we can easily uh, remove by noise gating here with the high frequency current transformer. We capture the signal in leads carrying the disturbance signal, optimize the thresholds, and here you see pattern with noise, pattern without noise. Last but not, le not least, I've already uh, outlined that in the, in the previous slides, spectrum analysis is a very, very effective tool to limit the noise, and we are especially looking at the signal to noise ratio in the first, uh, in the first stage and select our frequency 
based on this ratio. So here we have a quite stable uh, signal transfer or stable signal level, almost no noise. Clearly here, low frequency range, good signal to noise ratio offered the best compromise to do um, the PD detection. If you would have measured over here, you see the ratio to the red disturbance signal is very poor, so not recommended to use this detection bandwidth for the PD measurements. Yeah, of course, here uh, again, uh, the focus on our high frequency uh, blocking filters, which we offer in a wide range, uh, 100 kV, 50 kV, 30 kV. So um, the voltage level definitely meets the primary injection voltage of the step-up trans of the voltages of the step-up transformer and tertiary windings. Looking at, uh, again, our ICM system, here we see the 10-channel uh, uh, ICM system. Um, this system is definitely compatible with all relevant standards, as Charles already explained in the first chapter of the BPS of today. Uh, but the system is really a great tool for both field and factory environment. Um, customers should not be worried if they acquire uh, such system, including all accessories. Uh, in Power Diagnostics, uh, we can offer really advanced customer trainings based on factory accept, uh, optimized for factory acceptance applications, but also for fault finding applications. So uh, yeah, this is a very positive uh, addition to the testing package. Now we come at the most interesting uh, chapter of this presentation, uh, PD troubleshooting strategies and some case studies. Why do we have to locate partial discharge in transformers? A very um, good question to ask. So PD, first of all, is an acceptance criteria uh, to be met. If the PD level has not been met, the transformer does not pass the test, cannot be invoiced, and stays in the test room. So if PD can then be located, the problem uh, can be pinpointed and uh, yeah, attempt to be solved in pretty short time as production processes are, are very tight in, in transformer factories, especially the test rooms are occupied all over the time. If you could do that in the factory, uh, it's a very effective thing to do and uh, saving a lot of costs and avoiding, of course, uh, big penalties and excessive transportation costs when it comes to location at site um, to move transformers back to the factory for repair. Just looking at uh, the 400 MVA uh, power transformer, for instance, with a yeah, budget price in the range of uh, three to four million euro, just moving these transformers back to the factory within Europe approximates already the, uh, the cost price of a transformer. So if repairs and fault assessments can be done on site, it only has its advantages. And on the right hand side, you see, for instance, uh, a picture of a transformer that is uh, being detanked time-consuming process, time is money for everyone. So if PD location can be done and we succeed in that, that we can provide coordinates of the failure inside, it's very, very effective uh, for everybody. Especially looking at the offshore industry, um, if fault location can be done uh, on site and repair can be done on site, tremendous transportation costs are, are really saved. What is the approach to do troubleshooting uh, on power transformers? Uh, first of all, the philosophy is to, to repeat the uh, factory acceptance test. So to start with a three phases induced voltage test and to perform advanced electrical PD measurements. Before doing the PD measurements, uh, we spend some time to do a characterization of the transformer. That means we use our calibrator, inject in each and every bushing we have a certain magnitude and study the response to the others and compare that later on uh, with a real PD activity to have an idea of the internal coupling. Uh, of course, in-depth analysis of the phase resolve partial discharge pattern is one of the key things to do a first rough estimation of the discharge location. Then we already know what kind of PD, the type and origin of PD uh, is inside the, the main tank. If we find partial discharge with, so to say, um, uh, a non-stable phase position or a phase position that uh, refers to a differential field, it can also probably be very interesting to not only perform a three phases induced voltage test, but to also do a single phase excitation or even an applied voltage test. Finally, uh, with a time domain measurement, we can really confirm the travel path, compare polarity and cross coupling to the other terminals. So a very effective tool and method methodology to add to the standard phase domain measurements. The same with frequency measurements, comparing spectrums, um, 
from all the winding terminals decoupled uh, at the capacitive test steps can really learn if a signal is occurring closer to the bushing or deeper inside the winding. And finally, we will focus on acoustic PD location for effectively providing um, coordinates of an internal PD source where we have here an advanced um, semi-automatic semi triangulation software package named the uh, ICM Acoustic Software. Again, as uh, already explained in, 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 the, uh, in the overview slide, um, we start repeating uh, the induced voltage test in three-phase configuration according to the FAT factory acceptance test uh, circuit. But um, besides installing quadruples to the uh, required high voltage and medium voltage bushing, so over 72.5 kV, we also fit sensors to the tertiary windings. We also fit even CTs on the core bushings so that we can really make a good comparison and a good, uh, do a good estimation of the signal coupling inside the transformer. So we compare every injection point with each terminal. And by this means, we can entirely understand how the signal distributes inside the transformer and how sig signal couples from terminal to terminal. Here, for instance, we see uh, this uh, calibration matrix, which collect all this data. For instance, here on the high voltage S phase, we injected uh, a calibrator pulse and a response of 32% was received on that same low voltage phase. So this uh, ratio, of course, we have to observe when there is internal PD, if we have the same ratio, a lower ratio or a higher ratio, which basically tells us if the problem is closer to the bushings, deeply buried inside or external. Of course, we have to look at um, the pulse polarity, but that we rather do in, in time domain configuration um, measurements. All right. In the next slide, um, we show basically the um, advanced electrical testing. So an example of that. Here we have the equivalent diagram of an uh, auto transformer, um, where we do have the common winding and on top the uh, regulating winding. So here we have the high voltage uh, terminals and the neutral. And we see here a cross coupling matrix. We did a calibration for each high voltage phase and measure the response to the other. So we got like 100% of the signal on the R phase and six to 8% coupling to the high voltage terminals. But interesting to see in this case was if we injected in the neutral, we had 15% coupling, equal 15% uh, coupling to the neighboring high voltage terminals. When we did the measurement later on, we found a, a PD level of 750 picocoulomb of the same discharge type on the neutral. Uh, which was coupled, uh, which was detected with about 330 picocoulomb on the 1V uh, or 1S line terminal. Uh, the problem was also perfectly in phase with the zero crossings of this um, central phase, but you see actually that the signal on the neutral is twice as large than um, on the line side. And also here, looking at the coupling factor found during calibration, we have here in this case a coupling factor around 44%. That means the signal definitely travels from inside and is uh, located closer to the bushing. So a good candidate for the fault location in this case was the regulating winding, which is actually bait, which is actually uh, closer to the neutral terminal and make uh, also ensures that we have this equal distribution to the other phases. So here the, the dominant signal was on the neutral. The same signal was detected on the line side, but magnitude wise, we made a comparison with the calibration factors and found that the problem should be uh, in or close to the regulating winding, which explains then the higher coupling than found during calibration. Here we have another example of a, a void pattern, a spherical void or gas inclusion. So on the left hand side, we see that the phase position doesn't show a match with the zero crossings. On the central pattern, we see that it's, it's the same void. Uh, with correct polarity and correct phase position. And we also see here again, a stronger signal on the neutrals. Also in this particular case, the problem was uh, closer to the neutral. So here important to look at the phase position, polarity of the pulses, um, and then make a comparison of the magnitude and the coupling factors as found during calibration, which is very efficient to do a first rough indication of the uh, PD source. Well, if we have um, like uh, PD, for instance, here occurring in a differential field, we are, of course, very interested to, or keen to know to which phase this PD belongs. 
in this case, it makes sense to change over from a three phases induced configuration to a single phase induced voltage measurement. Um, this we have to do then phase by phase, and by doing these tests, we can assign to which uh, phase this PD belongs, or it is or if it is effectively uh, between high voltage windings um, uh, and occurring in a differential field. When it is a problem, for instance, between high voltage and low voltage winding, or a problem winding to the tank, we can, of course, also do the applied voltage measurement. If we have problems, for instance, in the barrier insulation between high voltage and low voltage winding, this is a perfect test to use because we can either earth the low voltage winding and apply on the HV and vice versa. And PD in this barrier will be very, very, very well triggered by an applied voltage measurement. So changing the excitation mode is also a very efficient tool to do a, a second uh, rough estimation of the phase position after advanced electrical testing. As already explained, analysis in time domain. Uh, why is time why are, why are time domain impo measurements important besides the phase domain measurement? Well, a time domain signal never lies. It shows how the signal travels and distributes throughout the transformer and how the responses and coupling or crosstalk is to the other neighboring terminals. So studying the polarity, the rise time, and the oscillation of these signals can determine uh, in a third step or confirm what was already as assumed in the first and second step after a phase domain uh, analysis and eventually also an organization in a different um, excitation mode. So what is the, the power of a, of a time domain measurement? Basically, um, problems occurring closer to the Lyme terminals will, will provide uh, sharp pulses like shown over here with a short rise time and means a high bandwidth. And if you do a calibration and you measure similar rise times uh, later on with the real PD, you can be sure that the problem is closer to the bushings. This is, for instance, a time domain uh, oscilloscope screenshot where we have a calibrator pulse injected in a high voltage terminal and where we are measuring the response on a neutral terminal. You see here a time delay of approximately 120 nanoseconds and you also see that the neutral signal, neutral time domain signal is more oscillating than the high voltage signal. So that's, of course, by the RLC network in between line and neutral terminal. So again, problems closer to the bushing, they will approximate the characterization uh, or the calibration done. Um, and um, problems deeper inside the windings, they will show higher oscillations, uh, typical filter response, attenuation uh, of the signal, and um, the rise time will not be that sharp as a problem occurring closer to the bushings. Here with this time domain signal, for instance, we see three identical signals that were acquired without any time delay at the same time on three winding terminals. And this confirms also that the time domain measurement is very efficient to determine that this signal was an external uh, noise signal sim uh, simultaneously occurring on uh, all the phases. Spectrum analysis is a second great tool um, to do a further rough estimation of the um, of the fall location. So um, problems closer occurring closer to the bushings have generally higher frequency content. Probably pro problems or issues deeper buried inside the winding show high attenuation and also loss of high frequency components. That means if we do again a characterization, so we inject with the calibrator on the bushing and we acquire the spectrum, we can also see how the signal spectrum uh, is transferred to the other bushings. That means in brief, if a spectrum of a calibrator pulse matches the spectrum of the real PD, it is very, very, very realistic that the PD is occurring closer to the bushings. So problems deeply buried inside will cause strong or introduce strong attenuation um, and actually um, show high uh, resonances by the RLC circuit as well. So besides the time domain, spectrum, in, spectrum analysis can also be of additional value. And uh, I do have an example of that. So that was... Um, a 530 MVA generator step-up transformer, 400 kV winding, consisted of um, oil cable terminations. This, trans this, this setup on this transformer was uh, uh, with continuous monitoring. So we did uh, PD calibration here uh, on this uh, transformer and we measured also the spectrums during calibration. You see here basically uh, the same signal shape entirely. Uh, when the unit was calibrated and the unit was online. So we already had the assumption that 
the problem that was actually reported being a floating potential activity here seen by the the uh, row of pulses with even magnitude synchronized on the zero crossings indicating in fact a contact problem so we already had a good idea that the problem was effectively uh, occurring closer to the bushings and what was found out was actually that the problem was uh, caused by um, missing electrical connection in the uh, corona shields of the bushing so uh, those were not physically connected to the uh, high voltage conductor and were causing a floating ac potential activity coming to uh, acoustic location uh, the last uh, and most interesting tool of course to pinpoint pd activity so if we have the electron avalanche uh, of, of a partial discharge it also, besides the high frequency current impulse, generates local heat. And by this local heat, we have a rapid local pressure increase. Um, by this pressure increase uh, in liquids, for instance, we have a spherical pressure wave. Uh, and in uh, solid materials, we have the same spherical pressure wave, but in addition, a transverse wave. That means we have all kinds of acoustic uh, waves also prop propagating throughout, through the entire transformer, which can be captured by piezoelectric sensors. That means we also have different transmission velocities for acoustic signals and therefore it should be very well understood if a signal travels a direct oil part or if uh, a signal for instance travels a steel wall so we have of course we have of course the interest to look at direct waves but that's not always possible so if we see an acoustic signal uh, we have to analyze the pulse shape and then we can see if this is a direct wave so we should apply pulse propagation speed of 1400 meters a second for a direct, direct oil part or if we see really that the signal is traveling the steel then we need to take a, a propagation factor which is approximately four and a half times higher basically the um, acoustic um, measurement or acoustic triangulation is based on solving the sphere functions so we have here three sensors uh, one sensor in each plane and we solve the sphere functions pure theoretically and that will bring us the discharge location however this is too theoretically um, consider con too theoretic consideration as a transformer tank is not just an empty tank filled with oil but we do have an active part so it's not entirely homogeneous in size uh, and that means by the different materials like press board spacers and so on we have different transmission paths inside the transformers and that means also different propagation of acoustic signals and definitely also a lot of reflections. So basically looking, on, looking at triangulation of um, uh, acoustic signals in power transformers, it's based actually on solving a flat problem in two dimensions. So what we do is strategy. So first we do an electrical measurement and we use this electrical measurement and that can either be by, by an HF measurement according to the uh, IC6270 or by a by a UHF antenna, for instance, we ensure that we have an electrical signal because in a transformer, there are a lot of other acoustic signals like vibrations, bark, housing noise, magnetostriction. So we need to make sure that if we measure acoustic signal, that this is produced effectively by the uh, electrical PD signal. And therefore we use the electrical signal as triggering. Of course, we need to understand also the internal construction of the transformer because uh, if we have magnetic shunts on the, on the uh, tank wall this actually may hamper uh, acoustic signals to reach the tank wall and in fact the the acoustic sensor so we should very well know know if there are small gaps in between the wall shunts or if there are some areas which allow uh, direct detection on the tank wall so the construction of the transformer is important to know um, so again we use the electrical trigger signal to trigger the acoustic signal to make sure that we have the um, uh, triggering on the real PD. Usually we scan with three sensors in a row. Uh, we start with a quite wide distance out of each other and uh, we move the sensors along the tank and on, at, at, the, at the moment one, when one of the sensors catches the activity, we move the two other sensors closer, closer, closer to the, the sensor showing the dominant signal. And we of course try to find uh, a position on the tank where the acoustic signal has the shortest travel time to the electrical signal. We do have a special triangulation software package for this. This is the ICM uh, acoustic software where we can load a horizont horizontal acoustic time domain measurement and a vertical screenshot of an acoustic time domain measurement and then enter actually the relevant acoustic sensor positions with a certain reference of the tank, left bottom or upper bottom or right bottom. 
uh, and then actually this is semi-automatically generated triangulation providing us the x y and z coordinates uh, even the transformer model can be drawn uh, that you have a really good visualization of the of the defect uh, provided by the software to, con to conclude this uh, acoustic PD location, I, I have a case study or, an, or a, a measurement which, of a measurement which we have done a couple of years ago. So that was on a 450 MVA generator step-up transformer, uh, 400 kV on the HV and 17 kV on the, on the medium voltage. We had DGA results of this transformer and there was like 440 ppm H2 in the DGA analysis. So here, uh, yeah, there was really uh, an urgent case to confirm uh, the PD source and yeah, that there was PD was very obvious, but uh, the measurement had to preferably confirm the location. So we did an electrical PD measurement in three phases induced configuration. And we were very astonished to see here the initial PD inception that was already at only 45% of the rated voltage showing a, a surface discharge that was initially with a magnitude around 400 picocoulomb. Uh, while further increasing uh, the test voltage stepwise in, in steps of 5% uh, of the rated voltage, we found that there was a very rapid increase of the PD uh, detection mag of the PD magnitude. And uh, we decided to directly um, reduce the noise flow, uh, reduce the test voltage to get uh, the PD magnitude under control. But to our astonishment, um, the, um, even when lowering the test voltage, the PD magnitude went up. And we saw actually a fast transition from a surface discharge into an arcing activity. And that ended with really magnitudes over 100 nanocoulomb. So we reduced the, the test voltage really uh, to a minimum level uh, that we still had an electrical trigger um, in order to do um, a further acoustic uh, location attempt. What happened was uh, when we compared the signal coupling uh, during calibration, we had a similar coupling uh, during the real pre-D measurement. So the first uh, ID was, or the first assumption was that uh, the PD was closer to the line side terminals of the high voltage winding. And um, this conferred, in fact, that we had an internal source, internal PD source, and we had a first rough indication of an area where we expected uh, that the PD source was uh, was located and the PD was measured only on the on the central winding, on the, v, on the V winding. So we started two-dimensional acoustic scanning, first in horizontal direction. And um, actually we found um, good signal here on the angled uh, bottom part of the tank, where we could view actually uh, in the oil channels uh, coming down to the bottom pressure disc, which carry the acoustic signal over the sticks um, following the cylinder direction. And then there is a small gap where we can really view uh, onto the bottom pressure disc and therefore this angled part on the bottom of a really good signal. Um, so there uh, we found signal on with the central sensor. And that means we changed over to vertical detection and put the sensors uh, on the central sensor of the horizontal position, but then in vertical direction. And there we found the fastest signal here with the upper sensor. Uh, and that was a quite direct wave, uh, the third one here in the oscilloscope screen. So the, the, the rough ID of this uh, PD location measurement was the central coil, somewhat left from the center from the, from the coil, uh, but uh, in vertical direction, effectively uh, the middle position or the center of the coil. So the, the triangulation, which we have done, pointed really that uh, we had a problem in the center of the coil, somewhat left from the center line. As you also see here, the problem is a bit more left from the center line. And um, what we uh, found then later on was that from the backside, we found the same uh, location. And that confirmed, in fact, that we uh, had the assumption that the PD problem was at the lead exit of the central coil. Um, then we provided the coordinates in the report. The oil of this transformer was drained. Customer did a visual inspection and this confirmed really the, the assumed uh, location. So here on the lead exit, there were traces of, um, of arcing in the press board here. And that was the, the main reason um, for, the, uh, for the problem. So a combination of, of PD effective, so surface PD and signs of arcing 
um, there was only a small content of C2H2, uh, acetylene in the tank, generally um, hydrogen. But here you see a nice case um, where a DJ analysis was confirmed uh, with a PD location, everything done at site using our mobile test system. So the summary of this presentation, so on-site testing these days uh, shows definitely an increasing demand. Uh, with uh, site investigations these days, um, we see more and more the use of um, uh, electronic power supply systems. Uh, with advanced filtering, noise cancellation, and a powerful PD detector, uh, with of course a spectrum analyzer, we can these days uh, meet the factory um, standards to do a site acceptance test according to the standard, uh, but in non-shielded environment. If it comes down to PD detection, the characterization, as it was explained in the fault finding strategies, is very important to understand and get a first rough ID of the discharge location. Um, we have various troubleshooting methods like spectrum analysis, like time domain analysis, which can then be used to confirm the phase domain analysis. But last but not least, the powerful acoustic PD location method is a very good tool and it has already been proven to be uh, very effective uh, for a broad range of, of large power transformers, uh, new build transformers, where we gave support um, with the uh, PD location measurement. So here we are, here we are uh, at the end of uh, this presentation. I really like to thank you for your participation and for your attention. And we are very happy to uh, answer any of your remaining questions. Thank you very much and have a good remaining day. Thank you, sir. That was great. Uh, really great information in there. So we're uh, wrapping up the second segment of our uh, seminar here. We'll take a few minutes to answer as many of your questions as we can as time allows. Uh, for those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a brief survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon future seminars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or a quote on any mega products. A copy of the presentations, certificate of attendance, along with a link to the video recording of the seminar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars on our website at us.megar.com webinars. And be sure to join us for our upcoming special webinar series launching in a couple of weeks. All right, so let's jump into questions. Our first one I'm going to send over to Charles. Uh, Charles, what do you use uh, for a source in the field for the test voltages? So Jerome uh, covered that um, very detailed, but I'll kind of just go, gloss over it now. Power Diagnostics utilizes an electric pow uh, power supply and a converter-based one. Um, and, and the fact of it that, and with the with the transformer that they have, you know, they have the three phase transformer made out of three individual single phase, and and of course the line filters, and then they have their their reactor, 500 kV reactor. Um, actually, as I'm talking about it, I just realized it's on the screen right there for you. Um, and really, this offers higher flexibility and mobilization. Um, because it's compact size and, and lighter as compared to like uh, drone covered the the typical motor gen set or motor generator set where motor gen sets are going to be large bulky and and the main thing is is they have a, fr a fixed test frequency where the advantage to the converter based uh, power system is a variable frequency that allows you to optimize the the total power used by canceling the you know the capacitive reactive power and inductive reactive power therefore only leaving the resistive losses to account for um, so that's that's what's utilized by power diagnostics um, but and you know and and there there is another I, I'd like to touch on her own touched on another um, portable partial dish or uh, high voltage source by using the tracks which you know is a substation uh, portable substation transformer test set um, and it does have an integrated um, variable frequency power source and would be good for you know, cast resin transformers, as he put it, you know, for, for instance, um, the example he used was a good one for wind turbines, you know, uh, getting this truck up to a wind turbine doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and you really don't need all of that. You could use a smaller, more portable power supply at that case. So 
it depends on the transformer you're testing. If you're testing a power transformer, um, you know, you could use a motor gen set, although you're going to be limited um, by by its size and by its uh, its its uh, single frequency. But the the converter based electronic power supply really offers a lot of versatility um, and 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 is a, a very good way to go about testing on site. Thanks, Charles. Uh, additionally, for you, uh, can you use partial discharge on generators? So um, I believe you can definitely test for partial discharge on generators. And it's uh, I encourage um, anyone that's interested in partial discharge on rotating machines in general uh, or on generators and um, to watch. There was a webinar Drone gave, I believe uh, it was the 15th or the 13th of May. Um, and I gave one last Friday, so I encourage anyone that's interested to watch uh, those two, but definitely partial discharge is inherent to generators or rotating machines in general, um, as, and you know, one would think that, uh, so definitely testing is good for partial discharge on generators because in terms of uh, transformers, we assume it to be partial discharge free. Um, generators are going to have partial discharge. It's just a matter of monitoring it. Um, so when you perform a measurement or partial discharge measurement on generators, it's not necessarily do you have partial discharge as you would on transformers. It's more of um, the evolution. So it's re it's typically recommended to perform your baseline test on a trans or on a generator, and then anytime you perform your partial discharge measurement beyond that, you want to monitor the change or the development in that partial discharge activity, as well as any new partial discharge activity that may have came up. Thanks, Charles. Uh, so for Jerome, what from your experience is the average achievable background noise level for on-site testing? Yeah, I think I, uh, I went over that um, throughout the presentation when the focus was on on-site testing. So um, with all the uh, filtering, gating techniques and spectrum analysis, which are um, embedded in the ICM system, we can generally tune the setup uh, in such a way that we are uh, within the IEC 6 to 70 frequency boundaries. Um, but um, with a background noise level varying between say 50, 100, the maximum I've ever seen on a transformer was 135 picocoulombs. This of course depends on how we have to inject the test voltage because of course we have a filtered power supply. Um, but um, if we have to inject, for instance, since, uh, via the tertiary, uh, we have an additional damping from the tertiary winding to the MV and HV winding. So anyway, uh, to give an answer on this, between 50 and say 135 PC, according to the IC6 to 70 detection bandwidth is definitely feasible. Thanks. So uh, Charles, if I order an ICM system, but I want to add channels later, is that possible? That's a good question, um, and and the answer is yes. Uh, so, for instance, if if one were to purchase an ICM system, um, say to do testing on distribution trans transformers and only got it with four channels um, populated, but then down the road wanted to use it for power transformers and wanted to add additional uh, acquisition channels, then one could definitely do that. Though it is uh, noteworthy that there are two portions of or two versions as as Jerome and I both covered of the uh, ICM system and the fact that there's a half 19 inch rack and then the full 19 inch rack so it would be uh, bear in mind that if, if you do plan or wish to add channels later it would be best to buy the full rack and populate it with the amount of channels you need at that time so if you need three or four channels then you can uh, get those acquisition channels and still have the full rack to populate however many acquisition channels you need for your application down the road. All right, thank you, Charles. Uh, Jerome, are you able to recognize PD at bushings differently from other parts of the transformer? Yeah, definitely uh, with the uh, uh, strategy has been, uh, as it has been explained throughout the presentation, we are not covering only the transformer winding, but also the bushings, that means, um, by a dedicated characterization of the transformer by injecting with the calibrator at the bushings, comparing the signal transfer, the coupling factors, 
we do have a good idea uh, about problems occurring closer to the bushings. And if we see uh, cross-coupling factors, which are actually matching the calibrator uh, cross-coupling factors, so the, the, the real the cross-coupling factors of the real PD matching cross-coupling factors of the calibration, the problem should be very close to the bushing. And if we're going to do then um, a location attempt later on, of course, uh, we will definitely try to um, to put uh, acoustic sensors also on the turrets just beneath the bushing uh, to to verify if we can find acoustic signals coming from there. So yes, there are definitely some detection methods uh, which allow us to separate PD, PD coming from the bushings or from, um, from the winding. Definitely, Michael. All right, thanks. So Charles, do you supply high voltage sources to test other switch gear besides transformers? Sure, so Jean touched on the, the TRAX uh, substation and transformer test uh, system that has the high voltage source, the TDX capable of, of going with it that could be used um, and also mentioned the auxiliary output that could be used with uh, uh, another transformer. Um, and another another source could be you know um, our Delta 4000 that has a another 12 kV uh, uh, integrated high voltage source in it. Um, though it is it, it you do need to keep in mind um, frequency um, and and as well as the test frequency, which is going to be a line frequency as well as the capacitive load that you're testing as well. So those things need to be taken into account because those could be some limitations uh, depending on the size of the the apparatus that you plan on testing, but both of those would be um, good supplies. And as uh, Drone um, mentioned, the sensitivity with the tracks is five picocoulomb, which is um, a good sensitivity for 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 that um, instrument. So uh, those are two two options you could use as a high voltage source uh, to test other switch gear besides transformers. All right, Jerome. Uh, what is the difference between three modes of excitation modes? Uh, Jerome, you might still be muted. Right, yeah, right, unmuting yeah. makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so generally the uh, excitation mode, according to the standards, is in three-phase configuration. So applying three-phase voltage on the LV or territory with 120 degrees phase shift. But of course, uh, looking at a three-phase system, you can also energize that in single-phase mode. That means bringing up phase by phase, either with earthed neutral or elevated neutral. And a third opportunity is to just uh, not have the turn-to-turn um, -turn voltage by inducing it. Um, but an applied voltage, so energizing the complete winding either to the tank or winding to winding. So these are just three ways to bring the, the, the transformer winding under voltage with three phases induced and uh, single phase induced. We effectively have turn to turn voltages in the conductor circuit. And with the applied voltage test, we only have the um, same, same voltage stress on the entire winding applied to the grounded tank. All right, thank you. Uh, also, Jerome, in all instances, when you determine a location for the PD, is it readily apparent when you look at the site as far as discoloration or arcing marks, or are there other means you use to make the final determinations? Yeah, um, of course, uh, looking for arcing marks uh, makes sense if you have like DGA results pointing to, um, to acetylene and these kind of dissolved gases. But um, yeah, what we do generally is we, we focus on the, on the PD measurement. First of all, we then we do the PD location measurement and hope to find an acoustic uh, pinpointing, um, a success to do an, a successful acoustic pinpointing, providing us coordinates of um, the assumed internal fault location. Uh, and then with a the visual inspection, yeah, sometimes you have uh, arcing marks, but on the other hand, you can have uh, small gas bubbles um, buried into wooden spacer blocks and these also produce partial discharge activity uh, of, of a couple of hundred picocoulombs which make your transformer not going through the factory test but these kind of things you can never never find visually so the, the case is like I showed uh, that you later on find uh, evidence of PD or arcing in a visual inspection is not always the case so 
it depends uh, from failure to failure. All right, thanks. Uh, Charles, is there any value in taking measurements with the mega handheld UHF PD locator during on-site acceptance testing to provide footprint readings for future routine online monitoring of the transformer? Or would the energi energization arrangements be so different that the data captured would not be representative of when the transformer was in service? No, I think that uh, I think that there is some value to that. Um, the energization would be slightly different be, uh, from an external source to the the in service, and the conditions would be different um, all around. I mean, it, so there would be some difference, but if you have some partial discharge activity um, during your your uh, your site acceptance testing. Um, then that would definitely be uh, good and noteworthy um, to maybe set up online monitoring systems on those machines or to perform partial discharge uh, measurements um, using maybe the, the, the conventional method that we discussed um, to perform uh, on those apparatus. But there's definitely some benefit to that um, as the UHF uh, PD locator, the handheld uh, UHF PD locator is, is definitely a convenient way to to go through the site and and perform the measurement without having to um, to go through tedious measures and would give you good um, insight into whether there's partial discharge activity that would need some uh, additional um, monitoring or or uh, or measurements. So I think that there's definitely some value to that. All right, thank you. Uh, Jaron, I have one last question for you. Uh, can the same equipment be used for gas insulated switch gears? Yeah, for GIS uh, testing, um, uh, I think uh, we're then talking about uh, the big truck uh, for a GIS test uh, to energize a, a GIS to perform a high voltage test. There's generally also um, a resonant test set being used, most of all. Uh, the case is it's a resonant test set, test set with uh, uh, frequency, power frequency range of 50 or 60 hertz. So basically, yes, we can energize the GIS, but our system is optimized for power transformers. Um, and ge generally for GIS uh, energization, there are different kind of reactors. Looking at the, the ICM system, so the PD detector, uh, we can use the ICM system to do acoustic PD detection on GIS systems. Uh, we can also use embedded UHF antennas and connect them to the ICM system. But uh, we have also other instruments in our range which are more focused for, for GIS, um, for the GIS applications, so which, such as the GIS, mo uh, GIS monitor portable and the AEA compact. But again, ICM system can be used. The mobile test system for energization is not really optimized for uh, gas insulated switchgear. All right, thanks a lot, Jeroen. Uh, it looks like that's all the time we have for our Q&A session. Uh, if we didn't answer your question today live, we will be following up with you offline in the following weeks. I'd like to thank you all for attending as well as our presenters for those presentations. They were really informative. If you could, please remember to answer our survey. We would really appreciate it. That survey will also include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But thank you all again for attending, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.